<laughs> oh my goodness. So when Dottie and I talked a few months back and I told her about this book and you've already been hearing about it and yes, Claire's is wonderful too. Mine gives context, hers gives experience. <laughs> um, the thing that we were looking at is what is it about the Magdalene and about the feminine power that informs what's happening in the world today and what is emerging in the world as we go forward, correct? Are you up for that? Because I think that's really where we are. PowerPoint that I put together gives you a little bit of a review of the beginnings. There, can you see that? Yes. Yay! <laughs> of the beginnings of this work and of what uh, we need to be thinking about and gives you a little bit of an overview of the Madonna, Magdalene, and Beyond book. Some of you have read a version of that called Mary's Power. So we're extending on that book. And the first question, of course, is what is feminine power? Is it Rosie the Riveter? Or is it something far more esoteric, something inner? Is it the goddess manifest in all her forms? Or is it women taking charge in the man's world? Or is it something esoteric and abstract, which is the symbol of Isis with her wings, right? What is it that we are talking about? Or is it all of the above? If we look historically, we're accustomed to thinking of power as being in- This is not a a man named Shalom Goodman. I'm not sure what just happened. <laughs> oh my God, um, these are Jewish people. Yeah, I know. It, it, Everyone it, needs. Somebody else's something is showing up here. Have we got it off, do you think? I hope so. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good. So we're you know, accustomed to thinking of power being vested in political leaders, in warriors, in people who have been appointed at the top of whatever, elected to the top, or in some way you know, put in charge. And among women, it's women who act like men who have the most power. And in 2016, it was a fairly consistent view of that. But I think it's interesting that by 2021, the issue is not so much who has power, but who has influence. And this is a much broader range of people and far more feminine than masculine. So something has shifted. What we're beginning to see more and more is people talking about acknowledging both the masculine and feminine energy. And I love that this is from voicesofyouth.org with its typos and everything. <laughs> but it helps us to see that much of what we have been assumed or been taught we have to learn in order to be effective are what are called natural or naturally masculine energetic states. And the wounded feminine is actually interestingly consistent with the diagnostic statistical manuals definition of a neurotic. Um, so we begin to start having the unhappy person be, you know, in the feminine be identified as mentally not well. So something to be aware of that the ultimate healthy person is natural masculine and the classic unhealthy person is the wounded feminine in the culture as we're com com you know, come to experience it. Now, as, as an anthropologist and an archeologist and a reader of archeological materials since I was, I think 17, 18, somewhere in there, <laughs> Um, I began to understand that in cultures that have not been affected by empire, we're looking at relationships between masculine and feminine that are separate, but equal. 
That is to say the men have their realm of activity and responsibility. They're outside of the village, they're outside of the home. And women have their realm of activity and responsibility and it's generally associated with the home and maybe the garden and possibly certain fields and meadows that are considered women's areas uh, for gathering herbs and such things. The emphasis is very different in their training and they have different art forms and crafts. There are two kinds of rituals in pre-empire cultures. There are ones that are just for men or just for women, and then there are shared rituals. And the perhaps most significant one of those shared rituals in certainly in Neolithic cultures, in cultures prior to the Bronze Age, but often in some modern pre-empire cultures is the hieroscamos, the visible and quite uh, public process of uniting masculine and feminine so that the feminine energy and the masculine energy are both healthy and represented, represented in the culture. One of the things that began to wake people up to this is the awareness of these thousands of figurines, not just in the Middle East, all over Europe and all over Africa as well. They're called Venus figurines, but you know, I had to be turn about 60 before I recognized these bodies. These, these are not poorly or weirdly developed 30 year olds. <laughs> these are middle-aged and aged women. These are grandmothers. So what were called Venus figurines by the 30-ish anthropologists and archeologists who dug them up are clearly figurines of beloved grandmothers, people who were teaching, people who were nurturing, people who were supporting both the children and the adults. By contrast, in the men's world, we got a very different kind of figure. We get the, the you know, and these are all of them in the 20,000 to 50,000 year age range, by the way. Uh, so we get the, the wild animals, we get, you know, some combination of anthropomorphism and the bottom heap over there is various bits of tools that are identified and usually found with figures like this. So we have two different very kinds of figurines coming from the same period in these pre-empire cultures. It looks as if in most of them, the men are connected with sun and animals and the changing seasons, and the women are connected with the moon, ancestors and cycles, which you know the menstrual cycle is probably the, the lead indicator of and perhaps the main cause. But we also see that the men tended to build star, map, sun, circles, circles that were focusing on the sun's activities. And women tended to build womb caves. So we see the sun circles all over. Now we're finding them all over the world. There are even some in North America that are beginning to be identified. Um, and then we, beginning to see more and more that what were being called tombs by 30-ish something male anthropologists were in fact places where women went for their long uh, quiet times. That might be a menstrual environment or it might be a place to go and recover from birth or death or any number of things. And I think it's a pretty obvious comparison of this particular facility, the relationship to the womb itself. And typically what would happen is the entrance of these spaces would be designed so that the solstice or the equinox would point to different places on the wall and they could know when they had been in this cave for three days to come out renewed. You might be thinking about that as we go forward. Now, in those pre-empire cultures, the roles for women, mother, grandmother, matriarch, guiding younger people into healthy lives, you know, building and maintaining shelters, growing, processing, storing, preparing food, clothing, and comforts. That's a lot of activity. And to be the wisdom people, 
to learn and teach all of that which is above and to learn the healing arts, both the herbal and the mental or energy healing arts. And then to understand the cycles of life, to understand what's going on in the world in you know, year by year, decade by decade, lifetime by lifetime, to help people understand that this has happened before and this too shall pass. They were the wisdom keepers in the sense of the historians, but also in the sense of being aware of what must emerge because of what has been happening. And ultimately, the one who becomes known as the matriarch in a pre-empire culture is the one who speaks for the divine mother, speaks for the earth, speaks to restore that wise feminine presence in the culture. In Northern Europe, this became identified as the virgin, the mother, and the crone. The young woman who is associated with spring and all the joyous emergings and the you know, mother woman, the woman who is bearing life and is caring for life. And I love that in this particular painting, the dog here has a bunch of puppies nursing. <laughs> And then as autumn turns in the winter, we have the crone who is relating to different animals in different ways. And another thing I love about this is the bow that the maiden is carrying is the waxing moon and the arch of the branch over the crone is the waning moon. And so we have, and also the triple spiral up above. This is a beautiful depiction of much of what Northern Europe identified as the stages and cycles of not only an individual woman, but the archetypal woman, and ultimately what might be called the goddess, because the feminine presence was experienced as a presence and was given in each village, in each language group, a different name. And we'll see how that affects the emerging empire cultures as we go forward. As we shift into empire, one of the things I lay out in the Madonna, Magdalene, and Beyond book is in the appendix, the cycle of every 200 years, new herders, new people coming out of the Caucasus, Caucasus Mountains, new Caucasians taking over and conquering small dark people, conquering uh, gardening villages, conquering herding or hunting gathering tribes every 200 years from about I can, I, my earliest documentation is about 4,500 to 6,000 years ago and goes all the way straight through to George W. Bush. And we can just see it over and over again. And the herders, the Caucasians tended to be larger and faster and stronger folks. They tended to win the contests of skill or to overcome whoever was the leader. And they believed it was their right to do that, to overcome the male leader in any group because they thought of themselves as bulls. They thought of themselves as the head of the herd that would be overcoming any young bulls and controlling all of the cows as it were. And that they, they expected to then have the lead cow, the matriarch, be their partner. And as in those communities that had the Hiroskama ceremony, that became very powerful position for them. They were the representative of the new definition of masculine power and the matriarch got to put up with that. And what happened then was they imposed their will. These men imposed their will on anyone without regard to past norms. And the first place we have a documentation of that is in the Epic of Gilgamesh, where all the people in the community are just beside themselves because this guy has shown up as rightfully the person in charge, but he's going around taking whatever he wants, raping whatever woman he wants. He's just being, you know, destroying the situation for the community, the sense of community. And so they figure out all kinds of ways to get him uh, to go off and do something else. And they put him on a quest. And the Epic of Gilgamesh is that quest, which I won't go into today, but it's fascinating. 
one of the things that happens is as soon as these guys start to encounter other guys like themselves, they start hiding their women, they start building walls, they start taking over other villages, they start creating city states. It takes less than 200 years in one community, one region to go from you know, one relatively isolated, comfortably ensconced village communities to integrated city states, and then less than a couple more generations for those city states to become an empire. And Sargon the Great is the one who established the very first of those in his Akkadian empire. So we have the bulls, we have the drawing down here in the black and white is a representation illustrating one of the Vedic stories of the Caucasians coming upon the Dravidians in the Indus Valley. The men on horses is another representation from the Rig Veda. Uh, even though horses were no longer present in India as, long, as recently as 8,000 years ago, by 6,000 years ago, there were men on horses coming in and taking over. The bull and everything that it stands for was what they were hanging on to. Now, what's really interesting is the bull was part of the pre-existing cultures. If we go to Katalhoyuk, for example, we will see rooms that are adorned with bull skulls. The throne is a bull skull. I mean, they're everywhere but it's the skull representing the womb and the fallopian tubes, not masculine power managing a herd of cows. <laughs> so there was this weird way in which the bull got transformed from a sign of feminine and masculine power integrated into one to just the masculine. And then as soon as the city states are formed, we see these use of horses to you know, create sieges and other kinds of battles uh, as described in the Vedas. And the Vedas are possibly the first descriptions of all of this activity. They were probably written between 2,500 and 3,000, although cuneiform is just coming into place shortly before that. So as soon as we have those guys, the visible leaders are warriors. They may also be traders and more merchants and they become bureaucrats, the warriors helpers. And they're thinking linearly. They're no longer thinking in terms of cycles. There's no more idea of this has happened before and will happen again. And we need to prepare for it or we can be prepared for it or we can look forward to this ending. Now it's a linear concept. Record keeping re reinforces that. I've got a record of this linear progression. Um, and it's not kept in cycles, it's kept in a linear progression. And there are some people who suggest the moment we have writing, we have undermined the power of the feminine because the writing is linear and the feminine tends to be cyclical. And as a result, the women are more and more hidden and their sacred places are more and more hidden behind the walls. The guys are hiding their women and the role of women be, moves into the background. So now the figurines, instead of the, the little Venus figures, if you will, the grandmothers, they're mostly of men. In fact, they're a particular man. This is Sargon, and this is Sargon in his many forms, but he's sometimes transferred into becoming gods of the other names, Enki and Enlil and so on. We have new kinds of depictions of men beating up and killing other men, okay? And we have a different, the, the beginnings of these images in seals that is the beginning of the record keeping and telling these stories and then the very, very thick walls that are keeping the, um, the people who are wanting wanted by the men who are kept by the men behind the thick walls and if you look down the houses below are fairly typical from what was there before but this stuff 
is new with this emerging, we have to protect what we have from others. The females then get moved inside into the temple areas. And almost all of this art now is temple art. And we see that in India as well, that all of the feminine art becomes temple art and the masculine art becomes public art. The top one is a seal. These are two goddesses. And they are, you know, one is able to fly, is a, a light being, that's what the arrows are indicating. And the other one is standing on the ground and is connecting with her verbally. We have another situation here where we have men and women in line taking things to into the temple. This is called the temple worshiper figurine. It was found in the courtyard as you know, a, a representative of a, a woman praying in a temple. And then this somewhat messed up one, the one in the middle is the, the high priestess and the others are following and they are being led by what, we have no idea whether that's male or female um, who is leading a procession. So these are the kinds of things we start seeing during that time period, which, you know, if you studied Western civilization, you're being told this is an elevated form of art. And I understand that it's far more uh, detailed and the technique is far more sophisticated, but the ideas have become separated, if you will. There's a separation between the beloved grandmother who was the previous form of figurine or the animal that you know, a man has engaged with and these um, more or less spiritual figures, these almost um, abstract, if you will, ideas. Egypt is different from the Mesopotamian era, area and it's largely because of the African influence. Egypt is an African country only sometimes overwhelmed by uh, the Caucasians. So you can see the mix of skin colors in, in, a, in the various art of Egypt. And so this is Tutankhamun with his wife. And this is a generic Pharaoh with Isis, you know, being his companion and his supporter. And then this is just a young, young man could be Pharaoh, maybe not, with two of his lady friends hanging out in a garden. And that's a very different kind of depiction. It's the sort of things that's all over the walls in Egypt. I saw a lot of this when I was there a couple of years back, one of my great trips in my life. And very different from the kinds of things we just saw on the walls in Acadia, Sumeria, at almost the same period. Now, Tutankhamun was much later, but these other people you know, were in that 2,500 year plus or minus time frame. We go to the Hebrew text, which is our most familiar writing about these years. Um, we get a number of women mentioned, but compared to the number of men who are mentioned, this is nothing. This is a drop in the bucket. You know, you can, yeah, if you read any of the begats in the Old Testament, <laughs> you're aware that there are hundreds of men described in the Hebrew text. This is all of the women described in the Hebrew text. Each of them is from a different time. Each of them is used as an illustration of something. Now, some of them were hailed as prophetesses. Um, and you can see that it's about every 500 years a prophet shows up. And that is part of the shift or part of the, the, the little bit that I was able to follow of what was going on behind the scenes. So we have the stories of all of these men in Israel in, you know, and before in being in the country. And yet over and over again, at key points in the story, one of these women shows up and does something. And that's the same thing with each of these. Sarah Sarai is Abram's wife. And she is the one who bears 
the children that become Israel and Ishmael. And she is also instrumental in a number of things that Abram is aim aiming to do. Rachel, Rebecca, Leah are all involved with Jacob and those folks, and they're being herders. They're not being involved so much with the empire. Miriam, we're gonna talk a fair amount about. She helped get the, Egypt the Israelites out of Egypt. Rahab is the one who let them into Jericho. Deborah is the one who helped them overcome one of the kingdoms that was against them, as you can see here, et cetera. So each of them played a key role. Hannah and Abigail and Hulda are come in not, um, not as Israelites. They're mentioned, but they're considered separate. And yet they end up playing a significant role as well. And our final woman in the Old Testament is Esther, who saved the exiled Jews, Jews from extinction um, by convincing the, then, the new king of Persia not to wipe them out. Part of what we see as we're looking at the Old Testament is a couple of other little hidden things. And one of them is that Solomon is accused of having a thousand wives. Actually what he had and what he had to do in order to maintain relationships with all these tribes is he had a connection. He married more or less. He took into his harem, which was located in Solomon's temple, the headwomen, the priestesses, the embodiment of the divine feminine, the matriarch uh, or the daughter of the matriarch of each of the tribes he was building a relationship with. And that's how he built a control over many, many, many more miles than he could possibly have managed as a warrior. And this was a technique that the Egyptians had used for a very long time. And he just expanded on that. Now, some of these women were priestesses. They each had their own goddess, okay? They each had their own little alcove, their own little place where they worshiped in the, their own form of the divine, even in the temple that is dedicated to Jehovah. And some of those were then identified later as Ashtera's priestesses. And interestingly, a thousand years later, when Herod builds his temple, there are still priestesses of Ashtera who are expecting to be able to do their rituals in the temple. So there's a lot more about the divine feminine in the Jewish story than the Bible would let us lead us to believe. And we're beginning to find some archaeological evidence that's going to help us understand this. And then as we go into the New Testament, the third point, there is the woman Anna. And this is a quote from the book of Luke. Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She'd lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then she was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple. So Anna was living in the temple. Okay, and she came up to Joseph and Mary and the family. She gave thanks to God and spoke about the child as being the Messiah. So that's something that a lot of people don't think about when they think about the Hebrew temple. And if you pay attention to the various historical references, this over here is the women's coat, uh, court. This is a depiction of Herod's version of what the temple might have been that he thinks Solomon had, but Herod built this temple. But there's a woman's quote, court here. It's off the Gentile court, but not in the priest's court. And there is a tower that is taller than the other towers, and it's called the Magdal Tower. And the belief is that the woman in the, who lived in the Magdal Tower was the most powerful woman of the prophetesses and probably Anna did and then taught and prophesied in the women's court. All right, so let's go back to Miriam or shall I ask, ask if there are any questions at this point? 
All right, we'll go on. <laughs> Miriam is an interesting name. It's the, you know, there is one time in the Old Testament we see this name, Miriam, as Moses' sister. She's the one who arranged for her mom to become Moses' wet nurse. She followed the, the basket after it was in the river and persuaded Pharaoh's daughter to uh, allow the, um, you know, to allow anyone to be a wet nurse, and it happened to be Moses' actual mom. Torah refers to her as Miriam the prophetess and Talmud. So Torah is the book of the laws, the five books, the Pentateuch, and Talmud is all the Kings, Chronicles, etc., and Judges, all those other books that we call the Old Testament. So the Talmud names her as one of the seven major females prophets of Israel. You know, I just misspoke. I apologize. It's not Talmud. Talmud is the rabbinical commentary on the laws. Tanakh, that is wrong on that slide. The Tanakh is the book of all the other stories. T-A-N-A-K-H. I will change that later. So Miriam is part of the leadership of all the Israelites coming across the parting of the sea. And she leads the dancing, according to Torah. She leads the dancing. And she, you know, she is the one who calls everyone, let's celebrate and dance together. That's what kind of leader she was. And the rolling rock that accompanied them as they moved across the desert that provided water for them. I think that's wonderful. A rolling rock provided them water was called Miriam's well. And after she passed, it no longer rolled. And that place is still identified in the Sinai Desert. Here's an image from Coptic Egypt. You know it is because those are Roman, look, Roman dressed people. This is not an, a very ancient document. It's only 2000 years old instead of 4000 years old. Um, but that is Miriam leading the dancing um, following the crossing over. So Miriam was a head woman. She was a prophetess. She led the people in ritual before the tabernacle. She was honored and beloved of God as shown in her well. She taught and worked until one year before they left the river, wilderness. Now that's when she passed on. There was a, a time in there where she was very upset though. She got mad at Moses because he married a Cushite woman. A Kushite woman would be a native woman from the area, not an Israeli. And I think there were two reasons for her anger. One, she was, you know, why she, the head of the Israel people, Israeli people are going, is going to marry outside. That doesn't work. But more than that, they had both been raised in Egypt. And in Egypt, and in much of the world at that time, but particularly in Egypt, the leader of all was married to his sister. In fact, Abram and Sarah were half brother and half sister. So he wasn't lying when he told the Pharaoh that Sarah was his sister. <laughs> he just didn't bother to tell Pharaoh that his Sarah was his wife. And so <laughs> Pharaoh got very upset with him because <laughs> Pharaoh, wanting to attach himself to the, this head man and his people, wanted to include Sarah in his harem, Harim, but Moses, or Abram called him. Uh, told, had to acknowledge that they were already married. Similarly, Moses anticipated she would be co-leader with Miriam. She had every reason to believe that. And that was probably a huge part of her upset when he married someone outside. The only other time we have in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, the, a name that even comes close to Miriam is when Naomi returns to Bethlehem with her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And um, yeah, she arrives and she takes the name Mara. Call me no, no more, Naomi. Uh, call me instead Mara. Well, Mara in Hebrew, there are no vowels. So Miriam is what we would say M-R-M and Mara is M-R. It doesn't have the M on the end, but it's related. And then it's very clear that she must be a powerful person in the community and by arranging for her daughter-in-law to marry the headman, her daughter-in-law who she adopted as her daughter. I happen to know that story rather well. It's the book of Ruth. <laughs> 
All right, so let's look at this Miriam thing. Miriam in Hebrew becomes Mariamne in Greek, which becomes Maria in Spanish, Italian from the Latin, Marie in French, and Mary in English. And in the Jesus ministry, as we move into the New Testament, we find a whole bunch of Marys, one in the whole New Te Old Testament, and all of these in the New Testament. That fascinates me. And that was one of the reasons I had to write the book. In the Gospel of Philip, there were three who always walked with the Lord, Mary's mother and her sister in Magdalene, and his sister and his mother and his companion were each a Mary. It doesn't say they were each named Mary. They were each a Mary. So if this had been written in Aramaic, it would have been they were each a Miriam. So I came to understand that a Miriam, back to Miriam as the head woman healer, was, some, was a title. Joshua, for men, was a title. It meant savior of God. Moses assigned the army to Joshua. He was the salvation. Joshua is another way to say what has been translated into English as Jesus. So Joshua and Miriam, Yeshua and Miriam are titles. The one who is the savior and the one who is the healer. So as we go forward and look at what a head woman or healer's job is, first of all, it's to acquire and prepare herbs and ointments and pray for individuals in the community to prophesy for the community, to teach the younger women, to ensure the lineage of the leadership that she's got someone to follow her, to assist with childbirth, to assist with illness, with the herbs in prayer, and to prepare bodies for burial. This was their job. This set of jobs required being centered in how life and death and healing happens. It also required being highly intuitive it required being willing to step outside of the um, prescriptions for women written into Torah and then to be able to follow, fall back into it as needed. For example, half of these jobs required that they go get cleansed at the temple before they be with anybody else, particularly be with a man. So when we look at images of Jesus being pulled off the cross, who is anointing him with herbs who, and the oils? It is the women. I don't know if you know this, but someone has taken the Shroud of Turin and generated a 3D model of the person inside it. And that's what this is, is a 3D model of the person that the Shroud of Turin outlines and I've just given you a little bit of the the images on the shroud they're a negative image we got front and back because it wrapped him but it turns out that the body was anointed with oil and the herbs have pollen that is from first century Palestine so it's possible that this was not him it's possible that this was someone else entirely but it's interesting that the image is retaining such a full, clear person. All right, so who's the Magdalene? In this picture, she's the one with the long hair. Whenever you find any images of someone called Mary, long unbound hair tells you it's the Magdalene. Even if they pretend it's the Virgin, there are a lot of Magdalene images out there called the Virgin Mary but they are in fact the Magdalene. Another one is that she always has, almost always will have a jar in her hand or you know, nearby. I didn't do a whole lot of work on, or I didn't want to give you a whole lot of time spent, it, spent on the role of the Magdalene, but she um, come, is known as the one who anointed Jesus. She came in with the beautiful alabaster jar poured it over his head. Also at the home of Lazarus, Mary 
took a pint of this expensive pure, pure perfume, poured it on his feet, and the house was, and wet, wiped his feet with her hair, poured it on his feet. So this is a modern version of that, the expensive perfume and using her hair to wipe his feet. What's interesting about this, the meaning of the anointing, if you anoint someone on the head, that's done by a prophet for the king. Well, it's, and if it's done on the feet, it means respect bordering on worship and a woman with unbound hair in the presence of anybody outside of her husband or her mother was honoring her new husband. So a lot of people are suggesting that that was part of their wedding feast, that the feast that was being held here was the wedding feast between Magdalene, the Miriam, and Yezu, the Joshua, so that he would be able to step into his new role. In other documents around the Magdalene, the Gospel of Mary place, places Mary Magdalene above the male disciples in knowledge and influence. And Peter gets very upset about that. In what are called the Gnostic Gospels, the ones that were found at Nag Hammadi, the Pistis Sophia describes many, many, many questions being answered by the Magdalene in you know, very profound ways. And the Gospel of Philip is the one that says that Jesus used to kiss Mary, quote, often on her, whoops, there's a hole in the manuscript. <laughs> But the idiom is on the mouth. Now, the idiom means to kiss someone on the mouth is to tell them secrets. So this may or may not have anything to do with physical intimacy. But it does say that she played a significant role in his life and his experience. Then when we come to that experience the morning after the, the uh, on the third day, which is three day, yeah, on the third day in the tomb, on the third day in the cave. This tradition, including the language, what have they done with my, you know, with, with my, my lover, my king, my teacher, whatever the phrase is, that was present for 3,000 years before Jesus. The idea that the king of kings would go into a cave for three days, having been given a public death and come out alive and be greeted by the priestess, by the high priestess, was around a long time before Jesus. And some of us, and I suggest in the uh, book, in my book, that some of us believe that Magdalene was the occupant of the Magdala Tower. She was the prophetess for Israel, which gave her the power to anoint the new king. And in order for him to step into his role, he had to go through the ritual. And it had to be at a particular time, which is why things got kind of hurried up for that last week or so, because that eclipse and the subsequent earthquake had to happen while he was dying for this system to work. So, He's on the cross, he gives up the ghost, the eclipse and the earthquake happen. They manage to get him down. They put him in the shroud with the healing herbs and oils. He goes into the cave and comes out three days later. And what's interesting about the Shroud of Turin, I happened to be at the engineering conference where the en electrical engineers and various other forms of scientists were analyzing or announcing the results from their 1980s testing of the Shroud. And they tested it for paint, for blood, for photographic uh, you know, uh, uh, techniques and for uh, electrical burning and regular burning, they tested half a dozen different things. And their conclusion in 1987 was, we have no idea how this image got onto this fabric and it totally penetrates the fabric. It is not on the surface for what that's worth. So some form of radio radiation, and that's what they call it, some form of radiation occurred 
from this body. It's not the radiation of a dying body that is just a chemical thing. They said there is no chemical residue here. This is a form of radiation happened. So sometime between, according to the, the Bible, 3 p.m. or sunset, just before sunset on the Paschal uh, Friday, Good Friday, and Sunday morning sunrise, the shroud experienced this radioactive, this radiation, this something that we don't know what it is of the image of the person in it. If it's the same shroud, that would be the explanation of it. And then at sunrise, the cave is empty. These women have arrived shortly before the sun has come up to be there when the sun shines into the cave on the vernal equinox. Interesting. So they're there. The sun shines into the cave. There is no person in it. What have they done with my Lord? And she's outside going, uh-oh, the whole thing blew. He's gone. He's not supposed to be gone. He's supposed to come out now. She falls apart. She goes into tears. And the story is that she, you know, in tears, she's aware that there's a man in the garden. She doesn't recognize him because she's in her tears. And then he says one word, Mary. And she immediately hears, feels, and knows that this is Yeshua. And he says, don't be afraid, go and tell my brothers. So she is the apostle to the apostles. And that is her new term, her new title, Apostola Apostolorum, the apostle to the apostles. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and told them. So that recognition of her role reinforces all the other things that we have and suggests that the Magdalene was a woman of power in her own right. We already have that the women, those Marys supported and sustained Jesus and the disciples. And not only that, but she was part of a process by which the King of Kings could be anointed and established. Now, the Pistis Sophia and the other Gnostic Gospels all recognize her as understanding all of this was a spiritual process. It wasn't a political process. But the disciples still think it's a political process. So they're really up having a hard time. The men are living a very different story in a very different kind of culture. And that's one of the things that began with the breakdown of the village you know, cultures into the empire culture, that transition, male, male culture happened at one level and the women in their hidden world continued to have a very different culture based on prophecy, based on healing, based on various other forms of intuitive and um, feminine <laughs> characteristics. So the Magdalene, um, this is the Leonardo da Vinci thing that was part of the thing for the uh, da Vinci code. I happen to be able to be, uh, to get hold of a pre-restoration version of the Last Supper as painted by uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And the point that the da Vinci code makes is here they are. This was actually a um, scarlet cloak. You can see there's little bits of scarlet left. So they're in mirror outfits. They're leaning in the V form and it makes a W with the other guys. And my big thing is this other woman is the virgin in the rocks as painted by Leonardo da Vinci. Even the pin is the same, <laughs> the brooch that she's wearing in the original da Vinci painting and in the Virgin of the Rocks, it is the same person. There is no way that is a boy. <laughs> and I don't know if you can see, but you can barely tell there is a little bit of shadow under her breast. <laughs> the restored version 
ignores the scarlet, puts her in pale pink, and actually changes the painting considerably for her, not for any other characters, just for her, <laughs> which is fascinating to me. So there's something to be aware of. Da Vinci apparently realized or wanted the world to see without seeing that the Magdalene, and notice that it is the long curly red hair too, <laughs> is the important person in Jesus' life. The thing next to it is the beginning of the undoing of the Magdalene in the Christian world. So Da Vinci's painting was in the late 1400s. This other painting was put out in the 1100s. It was put out by a Dominican friar and the Dominicans were established, I believe in part to undo the Magdalene. This is a story. He's an Italian and it's written in Italian and it's his version of the Magdalene's life and it has all the icons in it. And it came out just at the time when her remains were removed from the great cathedral at Vézelay where all the crusades were launched from this great cathedral up to that point to a little basilica in the south of France in a little town called Massimin, M-A-X-I-M-I-N, which to this day has not been completed. It is still an unfinished building almost over 800 years later. That's how much they wanted to de disempower people's attention on the Magdalene. And there's a whole lot of stuff around whether you know, the Magdalene was the, um, the person that you know he had caught in adultery and whether she was the penitent sinner and all of that. Well, it turns out Gregory the Great in 591 led out, did a series of sermons and one in particular on her feast day uh, declared that she was. And then Magdalene became synonymous with penitent sinner. In the meantime, in the south of France, she's anything but. The window on the uh, left side of your screen is a portion of the Marie Madeleine window, which is on the back of the book and de detailed. Um, I saw it at Chartres Cathedral and was blown away. You walk into Chartres Cathedral, the first window on your right is Marie Madeleine and you can see it up at the top, right? And this is the part of the window that describes her coming off of the boat into Provence or Marseille um, in part, you know, that part of the world. And then this over here is from the same time period on the right is a description of her teaching. People gathered from all over to listen to her teaching she was a major introducer of the language and the ideas of Christianity in that time and place. She was so important through most of those years that not only was the Virgin Mother assumed on her death. Now, this is not assumption. Assumption is you already die and then the angels carry you up. And the same thing with the Magdalene. And the reason she's in rag, rag, rags here is because this is after she's been in the cave at Santa Bombe, which is above the town of Massimin in Provence. And she's been there for many, many years. And every day, the angels come and lift her up to stay with her bien ami. And then she returns to her cave and she studies and she prays and she teaches. Now this cave, this hermit's cave, I've been there, I was able to go there, was wonderful experience. It's huge. There's a little church in it. There are, there's a swimming pool in it, basically the cave pool. There's lots of room in this huge cave. It was actually before the story of La Madeleine was a cave in which the priestess of the goddess Diana lived and taught. It was a teaching center. And every year, thousands of people wind up a very narrow, steep trail up to this rather large cave and 
you know, have church services. And they did that for her teaching when she was there. So the Magdalene continued in France to be an important person, even though the Dominicans did everything they could to downplay her. And you, you, many of you have heard about how every year on her feast day, there is this wonderful procession, et cetera. I won't go too much into it, but for me, she embodies the continuation and the um, attempt to put away and not allow for the power of the divine feminine through the Old Testament transformation into the New Testament and Christian Europe. We know from the catacombs that women were powerful in the church. We also know that from the, the epistles. Paul often spoke of women who were his co-partners in bringing Christian communities to bear. And that I said to bear, that's interesting, to life. <laughs> wonderful. So in the Christian history, they were supporters of Jesus and the disciples. They held their homes, their homes, or they either you know, in their own homes, or they held other homes for the early churches. They were suppliers and supporters of the missionary teachers. They led communion services. And here's a catacomb. This is one of the catacombs uh, outside of Rome. So this would be if you go out along the Appian Way, which I got to be on, it was so cool. And you can see where the catacombs are out there. This is in the ceiling of one of them. And you can see this is a female person holding up the chalice and telling people to love one another as Jesus did in the, the, first, the Last Supper or the First Communion. Since Magdalene was kind of put away <laughs> in Christian religious practice, the mother, Mary the mother was it, the highest ideal of womanhood. And the only power that she had was that of communing with the Holy Spirit in such a way that she could give birth to this incredible God-man being. After that, she's embodied, you know, she's described as just a normal mom. However, in the Catholic tradition and in some of the other high churches, certainly in the Orthodox tradition, Mary the mother is prayed to as an intercessor so that the, her words will be heard when mine might not, okay? The Magdalene is seen as the embodiment of the feminine mystery with penitence and grief now being the emphasis as opposed to you know, power and wisdom before. The various female saints, at least half of them, as far as I've been able to trace, are adapted from local goddesses. So remember I said each community had their own communion with the divine feminine, the, the being that is the earth, the being that is the power of life. And each community had their own name. And so when the empires were brought together, they would simply bring in all those goddesses. So the empire um, has three or four, Roman empire, for example, has three or four goddesses who embody pretty much the same thing. And that's because they're from different parts of the empire. Well, as the Catholic church took over the Roman empire, as the Roman church extended itself through the empire, it did the same thing. It just called them saints instead of goddesses. <laughs> So the feminine divine in each region became the local saint. And or a story was told about someone and she became the exemplar of some moral ideal, Barbara and Margaret being examples of that. Women in the Christian religious practice were altar guild members. They were the ones who kept the church clean and beautiful and kept all of the fabrics and the metals and everything beautiful for services. In recent years, post-Vatican II, since the 1960s in the Catholic tradition, women have been allowed to serve communion. 
they were almost ready to be deacons, but that got put a kibosh on. So they can commute, serve communion, but they can't be deacons. Liberal Protestant churches have had women as ministers since the 1850s in the US, not so much in the rest of the world and only liberal Protestant churches, okay? So traditional Christian churches, conservative Baptist and other Christian churches, there is no room for a woman. So if we look at feminine power, in pre-empire times, there, a woman had that magical ability to give birth and to be able to provide and nurture and heal and guide, which was linked to the power of nature and the earth. And I'm going to add to that, that part of how her power was understood was the menstrual cycle. And women would return to the earth, the menstrual blood. Now, if they were pregnant or nursing, they weren't menstruating. So there was only the period between, say, about age 13 and about 50 when they might be menstruating at all, since most women had many children in the hopes that a few would, be, would grow up. You know, so there's you know, a 30-ish year period, maybe a 40-year period if you're lucky. But a 30-ish year period, you'd probably menstruate maybe 10, 12 times during that time. So it was a very special time. And it was a time when women would go and be alone in a sacred place and return their menstrual blood to the earth and learn from each other and support each other in many ways. The harem is, to some extent, the same thing women living together, teaching each other, supporting each other, and helping each other through childbirth, through the early stages of nursing and taking care of children, and also helping, guiding them through their relationships. Now, that became a political issue in many, many situations, but being co-wives replaced the red tent or the women's hut from pre- empire culture. Now, as we move into the empire, the status of a woman gave status to the man. So the guy who wanted to be the leader who was, you know, who somehow mastered the uh, over the other men, then had to connect to the highest woman who he saw as the lead cow, frankly. Um, he didn't see value in her as a being, except as the source of power and a way to have more kids. The whole value system that came with these new men was more is better, just as you know, uh, the larger the herd, the better a guy was seen in the community, the more number of cows, the more number of children, the better. So that was a big model for them to use and they adapted it and adopted it for themselves as men. Sargon went a next step further. Now remember he was that first emperor in Acadia and Samaria. He declared himself adopted by the goddess and raised by priestesses in the temple. So he not only was marrying the priestess, he was saying the goddess was his mother and that carried through all the way through empire culture for a very long time. You'll find it in the literature, the mythic story, the legendary story about many, many you know, empire emperor leaders for the next several thousand years. And the king and the Pharaoh, as I said about Solomon and the Pharaoh, they held their lands by marrying head women and priestesses, keeping them in their harem. And the Caesars, I don't know if you're aware of this, but a Caesar had to become the high priest of the temple of Jupiter, and he had to marry the high priestess of the temple of Demeter. And that was essential. So if you're trying to understand the story that's laid out in I, Claudius, if you understand that little piece, it may make a lot more sense. And finally, when we get into the Christian era, feminine power is totally unacknowledged. And that's where most of us started in our lifetime. Living in a world where feminine power is totally unacknowledged, unless you were Catholic and got some feminine power through Mary the Mother, 
and, and the saints, but not in the Protestant world, not in the Jewish world, not in the Islamic world, not in most of Western culture. Most of the empires ignored the feminine power. Now, in the last 150 to 200 years, as more European power has been showing up in other nations outside of Western culture, in India, in Africa, in South America, over, we'll say 400 years then, we've seen an interesting marriage of the traditional history, the, as for example, in Hindu tradition, honoring the goddess form, but within day-to-day -day life and in the economic sphere and in the political sphere, no acknowledgement of the feminine power. So today we would define feminine power as again, the ability to give birth and to keep a home, but now it's while being a provider and a community leader, that makes us a powerful woman. We have to do those things. And we have language skills that most young men don't have. And our focus is on relationship building. That's where our power is. And still the status of a woman gives status to a man. I don't know if you're aware of this, but if you're a member of a society such as Skull and Bones, or if you're part of European royalty, you have to marry from a select group of women because they're the ones that give you status and power. They have the connections, they have the resources. They are the women who will allow you to become president of the United States, for example. And CEOs must have executive wives. Some of the current CEOs divorced their first wife who got them through college in most cases or graduate school or got them through whatever and then married an executive wife. And then we have the notion of every successful man has a, you know, a woman behind him, yes. So in the culture overall, those are the definitions of feminine power. Christians and other people of the book, Jews and Islam as well. Um, feminine power is unacknowledged except in Mary the mother and the saints. Now we have another thing that's emerged in the 60s since the 60s, neo-paganism. And that has been paralleled by a shift in the sciences as well, where um, as luck would have it, <laughs> Lynn Margulis and James Lovelock called their theory the Gaia hypothesis. And that woke up a whole bunch of interest in the idea of a feminine being as the earth making decisions and evolving. And neo-pagans have been building on that and working with that and you know, encouraging people to go back to the pre-empire understanding of earth as our supporter, as our nurturer and our provider. And in truth, materially, everything that this body is, everything in our rooms, everything we touch, everything is provided by the earth. <laughs> So in that sense, it is a provider. And neo-pagans are encouraging us to see that in men and women, both. That that embodiment of the earth is possible in men and women, in men who are choosing to include the feminine path, which goes back to that early slide of finding the balance of the masculine and the feminine, which, frankly, was first laid out, as far as I can tell, by Carl Jung, who suggested that we all are both animus and anima, masculine spirit and feminine spirit. So what is feminine power? It's all of the above. But what is interesting is prior to empire, it was seen primarily as the ability to care for and give birth and be connected with the divine. Through the empire, it was turned into, you know, these abstract forms of Isis and Athena. And then there was the need for women to show up as filling in the male role. And most powerful women in our world today are recognized because they are occupying male roles very effectively. And what is beginning to emerge is this realization of the heart 
the throat and the third chakra as being the means by which, the focus by which the feminine begins to express itself. So the solar plexus, which is in the chakra system, that's where we have anger and that strong will and the lower two chakras, which are you know, attached to the body, the bodily functions and the, the strength of that are associated more and more with the masculine and the upper chakras are associated more and more with the development of the feminine. So there's a wonderful website, um, Lucy Hutchins Hunt, who's British, did this beautiful thing, what is feminine power? And I liked what she said. It is the positive magnetic force that contributes to enhancing universal outcomes. When a person combines taking loving action with faith and humility in order to carry out their higher purpose. It's a very profound statement there that is going far beyond the surface of bearing children and taking a position of power in a community is recognizing that there is this positive magnetic force that contributes to enhancing universal outcomes. And that is what the Magdalene was known for. Known for. And that is what, according to my understanding, she inherited from Mary the mother, who was the prophetess prior to her. So the lineage would be Anna in the Magdal Tower in the temple, being the prophetess, Mary the mother becoming the Magdal Tower and then passing it on to Mary becoming the resident of the Magdal Tower and becoming the Magdalene. Now, the same woman, Lucy Hutchings Hunt says, historically masculine power is identified with the ability to rule or quell insurrection through the leverage of fear or brute force. And boy, have we been seeing that lately not through the feminine actions of lulling, nourishing, and nurturing. Okay, so feminine action tends to be subtle and softer. And that's what she says in that final piece. Feminine power is derived from more subtle, more creative human behaviors, and is way more powerful, sustainable, and effective in the long run. The fact that what the women were and how they functioned was maintained underground through the empire culture, through the emergence of Christianity, all the way into modern times, tells us how sustainable the feminine power is. And as we look forward, what we're beginning to see is the definition of feminine power that still has the ability to birth and keep a home. But it also is recognizing that our culture trained self is part of larger spirit as our capital S self, that we can sustain the feminine power, whether it's in a man or a woman, can sustain a sense of connection with that larger self across time and space. And I mean across time and space. We're just we're talking about centuries, millennia, and the across the planet and work with it. And feminine power is able to encourage and facilitate that awareness in others to ensure that it continues to support others in becoming empowered. And Another way we will be seeing feminine power in the new culture is acceptance of the sustained power of earth as our supporter, nurturer, provider expressed through men and women always and everywhere. And what that means is we'll be looking at a culture that, had, that has no one in charge, that the bull and cow model is no longer considered even relevant, <laughs> that is a co-creative, co-partnering, co-operative kind of a culture. And the economy is based on sustaining our relationship with the earth and with each other, et cetera. There are all kinds of qualities of a culture that are based on bringing the feminine power 
back in to replace a simply masculine power structure. And that was where I wanted to end the system and the presentation today. <laughs> so I'll stop sharing. And I hope I haven't bored you all terribly with that. <laughs> Some of you have heard it before, most of it, but some of it was new stuff. And I just, every time I look at your face, Michelle, I'm just so happy to see you. <laughs> I haven't seen her in years. It's so beautiful. Thank you. So as we look at the culture that is emerging, you know, Milt is over there. He's helping us see how the indigenous norms have to be reinstated. And he's helping us see that over and over again. And Clara is working with so many people on getting in touch with that, that aspect of their capacity that they haven't been able to get in touch with in our culture. And Elaine with the Cultural Butterfly Project is showing how that is working and she's not here right now. And yeah, and Dottie is doing a classic matriarchal process. I don't think you realize it <laughs> by bringing people together and you know, introducing over and over again and holding the space for our becoming and our discovering what is possible. And ultimately, I think the noetic sciences are the science of bringing together both aspects, animus, anima, right brain, left brain, intellectual and mysterious, if you will, capabilities. That's what we are about. And that's why the culture is changing. And we're part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. That was quite a, a, a packed presentation. Very, very interesting. So does anybody, we have a, about 10 minutes. If anyone has a question that they'd like to ask Ruth to follow up on the presentation, feel free to raise your hand and ask. <laughs> yes, <Yep>. Mel. <laughs> yeah, um, in the context of of the issue that we're dealing we're dealing with many issues today, but the issue of survival really is climate change. I think, and I think uh, uh, looking looking at it from the perspective that I do, of uh, here is this transformation that took place four four to six thousand years ago when earth was no longer our sole mentor and we shifted into this patriarchal. And while the earth was evolving, mankind, humankind was devolving, it seems to me. And now we're starting to turn that around. And it seems to me that um, there's this dual um, uh, collaboration available to us. We, we can ask the question, what have we wrought? What's the root cause? We know the answers. But the real question that's confronting us now is, shouldn't we be looking at ourselves? What's the introspective work that needs to be done? And I think you've just put it forth, a lot of it. Thank um, you. Yeah, and I think it's absolutely necessary. These conversations need to take place and they're not about compromise, they're about consensus. Um, and and this is the this is the grounding for all of that. So uh, I'm sort of saying this, but I'm trying to really ask a question. You know, how do you see this playing out in terms of having that that uh, conversation and coming to that kind of consensus uh, in in a relatively short period of time? Um, yep, we're on the verge of it. So. There's about five different directions I want to go. <laughs> Um, I just, I'm, I'm doing a new uh, radio show. It's called Noetic Moments on the mm -hmm. local radio station, kxcr.org. So you can follow that. But I just did a show on Julian Jaynes and Julian Jaynes was convinced that prior to what I'm calling empire culture, the left brain and the right brain were totally separated. And then if we look at empire culture as the emergence of the left brain as the dominant brain, what I think is beginning to happen is the integration of the two, left brain and right brain. So the feminine power is in the integration of the intellect 
with the relational, right? And there's another piece there. And that, so that, that's one line. Another line is the well being of a community depended on the matriarchal presence, that woman who embodied the divine feminine being able to guide the community effectively and in harmony with the male presence, right? And I think that's beginning to emerge in many communities. And I think that's gonna be the turnaround, part of the turnaround. And there's a lot more that happened in the well being of the community. The soil was healthier, the air was healthier, the water was healthier because of this mindset as much as the actions, because of this capacity to feel the spirit working, et cetera. So there is a, a quality of the feminine power that I didn't get into as much as I would love to that suggests that the physical environment acts actually shifts when someone is in that harmonious state. Mm. Totally agree. And I have experienced it over and over again in my own life in little tiny ways. So I know it's possible, right? So then the third piece, you know, a third point, I won't go all five, but a third piece of what you're suggesting is this conversation. I'm suggesting the conversation dissolves, disappears, becomes unnecessary when each of us gets in touch with both animus and anima as integrated in us. Then we're no longer be, bringing the anima to the animus and we have to talk it through. You know, the, as we integrate it in each of us, that conversation it, is non-existent. So I'll end with that. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Suzanne had her hand up. It's so cool to see all of you in all these places. <laughs> it was, uh, I, ah, it was uh, Gary. It was a very, very interesting talk and uh, how things date back way earlier than 2000 years ago. Oh yeah. And there's, there was a lot happening way earlier that we have no idea where it all came from or what happened right and so much has disappeared from way back but you mentioned about the positive magnetic force at one point and i was wondering since magnets are bipolar <laughs> are bipolar uh, are we talking about monopole magnets magnetic particles or are we uh, talking about a positive and a negative magnetic force? You're marvelous. So probably we're talking about monopoles, but I, you know, most people think of yin and, and the feminine as the ne negative magnetic. And this woman is suggesting, Ms. Hunt is suggesting that it isn't a negative magnetic influence. It is a positive magnetic influence in the sense that it, it, it holds the space for creativity, for advancing, but it isn't in the sense of the um, act of going to make it happen here, <laughs> right? So the receptive allowing is a huge part of the feminine, okay? If, if I'm in pain or if I'm giving birth to a child, I have to allow, I can't fight it, okay? It's a receptive allowing feminine process which moves us and aligns us with the natural actions and processes of the universe, and then allows us to take steps forward in that. And I think that's what the Hieros Gamas was in part helping people to get when it was you know, made visible in the world. And I think what possibly the shift between through the 6,000 years of empire was to move that whole idea from out there to in here. We developed the intellect, we developed that active capacity that we've called masculine. We already had the feminine already developed. Now we are going to be able to integrate them at a higher level of development. And 
when someone channels someone or when someone accesses, you know, affects someone positively just by positive thinking, that is the allowing moving in a positive, active way. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> so it's, it's not really magnetic. It's just a positive mindset. I think she was talking magnetic in the sense of what is now called the law of attraction. That okay. it, it brings about that which is like it. So attracts like as opposed to repelling like. Something like that. <laughs> to use that word in another way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Okay. Does anybody other else have a quick question? Well, then I would just like to say thank you so much, Ruth. I really appreciate you coming on and giving us such a, a wonderful presentation. And for all of you for joining us, it is really fun to have people from so many different locations all on this call. And that's the beauty of, of Zoom. And um, you know, really probably the beauty or the, the gift of the patriarchy is that we went out there in our brains so that we could create all these external technologies so that we could do on the outer what we already could do on the inner. And so thank goodness for, the, for Zoom. So anyway, thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate having you all here. It's really fun to see everybody and um, meeting the new people. And um, if you would like to be on the email list, uh, put it in the chat or send me an email. My email, do you have my email? It's dkkoontz at comcast.net. If you'd like to be on the list for future uh, programs, I'd be happy to put you on. And um, I got your email, Michelle, and I will add you. <laughs> so anyway, thank you all and have a wonderful weekend and a month. And hopefully we'll see you in February. Thank you. Bye all. Thank you. Thanks, all. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.